Uh, welcome to episode seven of Elgin Museum in Conversation. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Alison Wright of the Elgin Museum Geology Group as we talk to paleontologist Bob Davidson. Robert Bob Davidson is a freelance oil well engineer who has been researching Scottish Devonian fossil sites for 32 years and is an honorary research fellow at Aberdeen University's Department of Geosciences. He has been the chairman of the Friends of Hugh Miller since 2015 and is a reviewer for the Scottish Journal of Geology. Bob has co-authored several scientific papers, including with the late Professor Nigel Truin, and has amassed a large fossil fish collection of some 700 specimens. In 2019, Bob was awarded an MBE for services to paleontology in Scotland, and we are delighted, Bob, that you're able to join us today. Welcome to Elga Museum in Conversation. Thank you. Uh, I know that you became a paleontologist and fellow of the Geological Society through a pretty unusual route, but we always like to start at the beginning in, in conversation. So can you tell me a little bit about growing up in Aberdeen and what yeah. interested you at school? Did you early on have an interest in fossils uh, uh, or just the normal dinosaurs that all kids love? Well, I must admit, I probably hadn't heard of dinosaurs until I was in my teens. Um, I was very interested in geology as a child and, and my sister still has a little collection that I put together of basically steens that I picked up on, on my travels and glued to a board and identified them. <coughs> and I think I identified them from the Hamlin guide. Um, Alison will know that one. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Coincidentally, I actually grew up on what is now Aberdeen University's campus in Old Aberdeen, um, in a little lane called Blackburn Place, where, which is, has got the Macher Bar on the corner. Um, I, grew up, I grew up there for seven years before we moved. Um, <clears throat> and round about that time that we, we moved was when I became interested in geology. <clears throat> but I didn't take it any further. And, Paleontology wasn't on, on, on my radar at all at that time. Um, but growing up in Old Aberdeen was, um, I think it was a privilege really, because it, it, it is the oldest part of Aberdeen, it's the most historic part of Aberdeen. Um, <clears throat> there's no traffic um, on, the, on the high street um, at the time. But even then, my mother wouldn't allow me to cross the road. So I only knew Old Aberdeen from the Macher Bar side of the road. <laughs> Uh, you've spent your working life, like many people in the northeast, in the oil industry, um, which must have been a relatively young and dynamic industry when you started. How did you get into that? The oil industry was, <clears throat> to my generation, it was inevitable you, you'd get into it. Um, if you weren't at university, um, then you'd take up um, a, a semi-skilled role. I had trained as a lab technician, so I applied to Halliburton, other, well, other service companies are available. Um, <laughs> um, as a, Not as many as there used to be, the way. Well, that's true. <laughs> they're, they're all amalgamated now. Yeah. But yeah, I applied to them um, as, a, as a lab technician, um, got the job, um, and as soon as I arrived in, in the lab, I was sent offshore to help with the oil well cementing operations. And I, and I loved the offshore life. So, and, and in those days, it was Aberdeen, there's something called the American dream, but back in those days, there was, there was Aberdeen dream. Anyone could go anywhere in the oil industry. All you need to do is apply and work hard. And that's, that's what took me through the oil industry. I worked for many companies and I'm, I'm now freelance. Um, and it's much different now. It's an industry I don't even recognize now. I say it's much more challenging now and, and um, you must yeah, have seen quite a, a change over recent years in particular. Well, I, I, I won't put my political hat on, but I, could, I see the same mistakes being made today that were made back then, but I see far more paperwork, which is meant to stop that, but mm. it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, I suppose that one benefit of in the work, being in the oil industry, your working life will have taken you all over the world. So. Um, what sparked your interest in paleontology? Where where were you able to travel to? Um, everywhere. Um, I even went to Japan for a day. I was told I was unneeded when I got there. 
So, <laughs> um, the, the most of my working life was in either North America or in Libya, apart from the North Sea. Um, and it was in Libya that my interest in paleontology was really sparked. Um, I always say that I'm not a trained geologist, but I do have a lot of geological training because I worked as a geophysical logging engineer, which means we're, hit, we're well trained in um, reservoir geology and stratigraphy because we have to analyze the logs that we're um, creating um, on, on the spot in, in some cases. So <clears throat> I'm not a geologist, but I'm a ge I was a geology worker, let's put it that way. Um, the, my first experience of field paleontology was when, when we had no beer in the camp, when somebody, forgot, somebody had forgotten to buy the biomalt, the, 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 the alternative um, pastime was to go looking for fossil sharks, shark, shark teeth. And uh, I seemed to have a skill that other people didn't have in that we went to the gravel beds for these shark teeth. And, it, and this, is, this is everything from Miocene to Cret Cretaceous because it just a completely eroded landscape. So everything was mixed up in these gravel beds. And everyone was finding shark teeth, but I was finding sea cow, um, fossil wood, um, reptile teeth, and I even found a horse bone and a dawn horse. And uh, <clears throat> I realised that I had some kind of skill that others didn't have because everyone could just see shark teeth and I could see anything else. So that was, I've got a, a Libya collection over in the corner there, um, which is, I'm quite proud of actually. Um, but after I left Libya and came back to Aberdeen, the ensuing years were bringing up a family um, <clears throat> and I really didn't have time to go out into the field and collect. It was only when the family were about three to five years old when I realised I could take them on picnics, <laughs> which would always be a fossil locality. So I started to research the old fossil localities of Scotland mm -hmm. um, with the kids. And one thing led to another, and I was introduced to Nigel Turin because I'd found a unique um, specimen of a lungfish, which he coincidentally was researching at the time. So a woman at National Museum of Scotland, um, Mihaela Andrews, introduced me to Nigel. <coughs> we got on immediately, and eventually I proposed to Nigel that we should go and <coughs> excavate a place called Tilly Quarry, which had been forgotten for about 100 years. Um, and that was our first research paper together. And have any of your children subsequently shown an interest in fossils and paleontology, or did you put them off by dragging them around the countryside? I put them off by dragging them around the countryside. <laughs> I, I remember think there's some parallels there with archaeology, where it's like, let's go to this <laughs> old graveyard. You'll love it. Yeah. I I remember my son spent half an afternoon digging a hole that he could shelter in because the snow was horizontal. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, at least my dad had an interest in heritage railways, so that was that was relatively safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like the beginnings of um, perhaps your interest in fossil, fossil fish. I'll, yeah. I'll learn how to say these words. But was that sort of really what triggered your interest in that subject or was there other factors bringing in there as well? I think the other factors were that all the literature I could find was over 100 years old. And I knew that there would be errors and omissions because 100 years ago is when the science of paleontology was just had just started. So th these are all beginners who'd, who'd done the early, very, very good work, but it was still very early and needed updating. So Nigel and I went on to, Nigel, I'll, I'll tell you later about um, what I'm currently working on, but Nigel and I excavated all of the known and accessible old fossil fish beds in Scotland over a period of about seven years. And I've only just realised that nobody knows this. Uh, and I'm trying to make amends to that to, to, to that now. So um, and were you still working full time at that point? So yeah. was this in your 
your sort of were you still offshore as well? So was this in your onshore time or was this weekends and ho holidays? Um, I, I, I tried to trim back my offshore time because of the kids were young. Um, so I, I tried to move to the office. But that, and that meant travelling to different places in the world. So I may as well have stayed offshore because I, I still didn't see the kids as much as, as, as I could. But <clears throat> yeah, it, I kind of dovetailed it all together. I mean, I'd be out in, I'd be out in the evenings um, mm -hmm. in the summer. Mm -hmm. I'd, go, I'd go straight to a fossil site from work. So at Dice in Aberdeen, I would drive to Fockerburs, um, mm -hmm. buy a fish supper on the way, do, do a couple <laughs> of hours of work. Supper. <laughs> do a couple of hours of work and then drive home about 10 o'clock at night. My wife was very um, accommodating. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, she encouraged it. <laughs> Don't quite know why. But um, I managed to put in several hours a week and working full time. Um, <clears throat> and got to know other people as well. I mean, I'm now working in a team of a Welshman, an Australian, a Dutchman and a London banker who, who, who we all contribute to various papers and, and stuff like that. So still quite active on that front, even more, even more active now than I, than I used to be. Now, as um, your extensive research there has led to you being appointed an honorary researcher at the University of Aberdeen, yeah. um, that must have been quite an uh, exciting time and quite an um, honour to receive that position given you didn't have the initial background in, in geology, paleontology. Um, if if you can tell us a little bit more about that and, and what yeah. you're currently working on. Well that, Nigel Turner was instrumental in that. Um, it actually came about because I wanted to become a member of the university library and then I could become that as be, by becoming an honorary research fellow. So Nigel got me and um, sponsored me to become an honorary research fellow. Um, <clears throat> I, I do consider it a great honour. This is my 21st year you know, of, of being a research fellow. Um, the university don't actually require us do, to do much, although in the last renewal, they've asked me if I'd be prepared to um, participate in workshops with honour students on geological conservation um, topics, which is right up my street, because that's what I've been doing all for the last 30, 32 years. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. Great to be working with the next generation as well, yes. just passing yeah. on your enthusiasm and knowledge. Yeah. And and uh, I was uh, an ex-colleague at the university has actually sponsored me this time. I probably shouldn't mention his name online, um, but um, I emailed him and told him my uh, fellowship was about to expire, and Nigel had been my previous sponsor. How, what, what would he advise that I do to get my fellowship renewed? And he came straight back and said. I'll sponsor you. So, someone I haven't spoken to many times in the last 20 years has, has recognised me as being someone he, he, he would not be embarrassed or foolhardy to put forward for, for the position. It's, it's, being an honorary research fellow is, is an accolade, really. And is that um, how much of time of your time does that sort of take up? Is that uh, are, are you working? less now and more focused on the um what i suppose started out as a hobby yeah i'd say um it's i try to work in industry because having a hobby like this isn't cheap mm -hmm. <laughs> that that you have to you've got to drive long distances you've got to maintain a vehicle um there are costs overnight stays and stuff like that that I don't get, I hardly ever get sponsored for. Mm -hmm. So I try to work maybe two days a week mm -hmm. in industry and a couple of days a week um, writing and the rest I just relax. Mm -hmm. I know you're still doing as many site visits as, um, as your time with when Nigel, which sounds like you were here, there and everywhere. Yeah, we were, but um, nowadays I do far less field geology or paleontology. Um, <clears throat> I see my role going forward as a, as a popularizer of geology and, and paleontology. Um, I'm, I, I would rather take people on excursions to sites than go there myself and dig. 
I have 700 specimens I don't need anymore. Um, and I, the, the amount I have got just now is enough to see out my research career too. Um, I'm using some right now on, on the latest paper I'm working on. Excellent. Are you um, able to share what that paper is, uh, Bob, or, or is that work in, in progress? No, it's um, it's actually a departure from what I've worked on before. It's more a it's more of a history of um, paleontology paper. It's um, it's trying to sort out the inaccuracies that were recorded by early scientists when they were looking at Middle Devonian sites in Moray. Um, and it was simply because Nigel and I excavated all these sites that we could we could get access to, and I decided that I need to write them all up now. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to write them up individually. I'm going to do two major review papers, Midland Valley and the, the nodule beds. But before I can do the nodule beds, <coughs> I've got to reconcile a site called Leathern Bar, um, which was very badly described from the early 1820s right up into the 1980s, um, <coughs> based on 1820 to 1850 errors. Subsequent workers perpetuated the various errors and myths that, that, that occurred over the years. And what we finished up with now is a notion that Le the Leavenbar site, site in the singular, is lost. Um, <clears throat> and several people have gone looking and not really had it much success. So I thought, well, we've got to sort this out because we can't leave it out because it's the elephant in the room in, in, in nodule bed paleontology. So I went up to the Nairn area and immediately found, within the space of a month, seven leathern bar quarries. <laughs> they're, they're all there. They're in plain sight. I found two brand new ones that yeah. had never been talked about before. So that paper was going to be a rapid communication, as we call it, which is under 5,000 words. Um, it's now 21,000 words, and oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. it, because the full story has got to be told and, and brought right up to the present day. And the evidence for the errors in the past have also got to be clearly explained too. So, and, and I always thought it was a wee bit of a risk too, because it takes, it involves taking on one of the Victorian giants of geology, John Grant Malcolmson, and showing that his work was deeply flawed, almost at every level. And it's plain to see in, 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 the, in, the, in the, his, uh, his published work. But being fair to him, his work was published after he died, mm -hmm. and he never had a chance to peer review it. So when we, when we produce papers, we, we receive a proof of the paper before it's... Um, we, we prepare the paper from our notes and from our field work, we then receive a proof back from the publisher. We double check that against our notes and our fieldwork, and then we prove it. He never had a chance to do that. So I think his what was published was a draft of what should have been the final paper. Mm -hmm. And the errors that you're sort of talking about there, is that more just um, a lack of knowledge at that time because it was still early in the subject? or is it a, a carelessness, a sort of cavalier approach, or trying to push things too quickly to try and say, this is something that it's not, or that kind of a mixture of, of things? I think you, you hit it on the head with that. It, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was too rushed. Uh, it, was, it was done over a period. He, he described all of the um, middle old red sandstone sites of Moray in the space of two years. Today, that would be impossible. Yeah. Um, but he was also chronically ill. So I think there were issues in his background that led him to rush the work. Um, and eventually, he didn't sanction the final publication. He, he passed away in 1842, and the paper was published in 1850 by the Geological Society of London. Only after someone else said, 
is if you still got this paper on file somewhere because you submitted the manuscript to them, mm -hmm. they found it and published it as as it was. Yeah. And it wasn't. It was. It was a draft, and should never have been published. And, so, and I, I don't think Malcolmson had the chance to try and map the area, did he? Wasn't he just working from cross sections? He was. He was just working. He didn't do any aerial work at all. He just did cross sections, um, <clears throat> and I've been. Clive Orton, that retires from the, B, the BGS, has been very um, helpful in this because they mapped the area finally. Um, oh, well, John Horn mapped the area in 1870, but um, Clive Orton and his team mapped the area in 2012, or between 2005 and 2012, because these things take years and years to do. Um, and he was very helpful um, in showing me that, um, not particularly that Malcolmson was wrong, but Malcolmson didn't present the whole picture. Um, and he, Malcolmson was only working from, as, as Alison will know, when you map an area, all you can map is the rocks you see. You, you then have to make an interpretation of the rocks that you can't see. And Malcolmson missed out rock sections which span 600 metres or more, um, which is a bit careless um, because you can get evidence for these are mine rocks. So you, you get evidence from mine, mine boulders and fields and stuff like that. There's a mine section underneath this part. It's not it's not it's not old red sandstone. But Malcolmson had, didn't have that kind of training. He was a medical doctor, so he didn't have that kind of training. Um, nowadays, another a gold prospector that I know told me that they a lot of the mapping they do nowadays is, is looking in dry stone walls. Yeah. Whatever, whatever rocks in the dry stone walls are the rocks are under your feet. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. Nobody imports dry stone wall material. <laughs> it's all collected on site. Yeah. So yeah, I, Malcolmson was a, was, a, was, a, was a man of rock as, as they say, but um, a man of his time too. So this sounds like, um, this is obviously me not being a geology specialist coming in from my archaeology with hat on. Um, there was a, a lot of work early in the sort of into the in the 19th century, early in the subject, and maybe not very much in between times to sort of more modern eras. Is, is there any sort of reason why nobody was really looking at things in the northeast or just? Yeah, yeah, Mahela Andrews, <clears throat> well, John Horn, produced the first meaningful geological map of the area. And that stood um, for right up to 2012. So he, he, he produced that in 1923. And this is another, another illustration of how long these things take. He yeah. mapped the area in 1870, but didn't publish the map until 1923. Um, <clears throat> Mihaela Andrews in 1983 went um, <clears throat> To try and sort out some of the irregularities that were in Horn's Horn's account, um, and she appeared to be. Um, I'm thinking of the word. She appeared to be very impressed by Malcolmson, to the extent that she she accepted everything he said verbatim. He said that Leavenbar was a low hill over a wide area with the fish bed exposed all around its base. And it just isn't. There is no hill in the area. So how Malcolmson came to that conclusion is, 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 is it's the biggest mystery of all. You could speculate. Because there is a hill north of the area. Where fish bed outcrops are found. But Malcolm, Malcolmson was describing the extreme south of the area in his section. So did he get muddled up between the two ends of the area? Was he listening to hearsay? Was he collecting local reports that may be not particularly accurate? We just don't know. But Neil Andrews took everything he said verbatim and produced the same um, <clears throat> erroneous accounts that Malcolmson did. Uh, she, she actually visited the, the site and didn't see that there was no hill there. I think she was she was very blinkered by Malcolmson, Murchison, and the other 
great geologists of the area, the era, sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a great sad story. It's 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 more of a people story than a science story. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does have it does have to be told because there are um several inaccuracies that um are better cleared up, so that in fact there there actually is an exposure of the Lethenbar fish bed, which has been there for 140 years, and people know about. But because it's part of the main outcrop, which is about two miles away from what they called Leaven Bar, no one connected the two together. So when you look at the various accounts made by Hugh Miller, Patrick Duff, um, they describe a fish bed that's exactly the same strat stratigraphically as the one that's been preserved two miles away. So when you put those two parts of the story together, Leaven Bar becomes even less lost because not only do you have an exposure that you can walk up to today, it matches the old exposures that are described in the literature. John Horn drew a, drew a section um, of, of this part, but for some reason people have been blinkered and just have not recognised this as being what we call Leaven Bar. Yeah. Mm. And being in the oil industry, obviously there's a lot of technologies have developed um, over the lifetime of the oil industry. Is any of that sort of new technology, does that filter through to the to sort of geological world? Is there anything that is um, usable now that um, helps to improve knowledge of, you know, if these 19th century um, hobbyists, geology ho geologists and hobbyists are who are kind of maybe don't have the same understanding or the same research available to them. If you're trying to sort of en enhance that, is there anything, you know, I know in, in archaeology, for instance, you know, we're using LIDAR, we're using sort of photogrammetry, we're using all sorts yeah. of, um, you know, um, geophysical equipment for that side of things. Does, is that um, applicable in the world of geology as well? Oh, I don't think as much as what we're, deal what we're dealing with is surface geology. So quarry faces, natural exposures, stuff like that. Um, LIDAR might help a locate areas, but we don't generally use geophysical techniques like ground geophysics to locate a, a formation below. We don't use very many boreholes these days, do we, Alison? No, nope. Um, but that's old technology. Um, the old American prospectors and Middle East prospectors used to go put a drilling rig on top of an anticline, hoping, hoping, hoping that bulge is a, is, is a cap rock. Um, that still gets done, but I'd say there's no there's no substitute for picking a shovel. Yeah. Oh, no, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think some of the. Um, previously extracted sort of fossil material. I know some of there's sometimes there's sort of CT scans and things of like that now and there to try and look at that side of things. So maybe it's more once you're out of the field, there's there's opportunity to to use new technologies more. Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm actually involved in a project just now that's using a CT scan of a single fish scale <laughs> that came from the Midland Valley. And it's important because it's an Actinopterygian fish, which is the earliest ray finned fishes. And to find one in Lower Devonian rocks is quite unusual. Um, so it, it was half buried in rock. It's at, Aberdeen, it, it's at Edinburgh University just now, um, being CT scanned. But because of COVID um, and the fact that their X-ray head blew up just before <laughs> COVID, the technicians haven't been back in um, for any meaning, meaningful amount of time, and they. The project's kind of stalled just now, but it's looking promising that we've found an, one of the earliest ray finned fishes in the Scottish fossil record. So we are using those kind of technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's worth saying that, that sometimes these new technologies um, aren't brilliant, are, are they, with um, uh, fish nodules? Because the density contrast, you know, between um, the organic remains that you're looking at and the rock, you know, yeah. aren't, aren't brilliant. So there are constraints with 
technology that that won't necessarily you know solve a problem that splitting a nodule you know with a hammer um, you know will. So technology is is great, but it's it's not necessarily the answer um, to the question that you don't know you're asking. That's true. Um, coincidentally, um, <coughs> the um, I'm, I've also used um, X-rays. When, when you when you collect nodules, your best um, strategy is to split them on location. Otherwise, you're carrying 100 kilos of rock home, mm -hmm. and, and and only half a kilo has, has got anything in it. So there's a lot of effort required, especially at places like Ethi on on the on the on, on the Black Isle, which involves a switchback hill climb of about an hour and a half with a rock full, a bag bag full of rocks in your back. It's it that's no fun. But we have, we found through a colleague that the best way to X-ray, for example, nodules which could contain fish from Scotland Midland Valley, is to take them to a vet, because vets use X-rays which have got the strength to um, X-ray the bodies of small pets, so dogs and cats, and that's the uh, that's the strength of X-ray that you need to X-ray a nodule. So if you, if you use a human-sized X-ray. Um, you can just get it's like over overexposing a photograph. Just, there's just too much energy, and you don't get the detail. So these are low energy X-rays, and, and if you want to X-ray a nodule, just go to your local vet. To do it. So we've done that. We've done that a few times, and, and found some good stuff. In fact, but this was X-rayed first. How? And we were able to determine that there was a well-preserved fish in there, missing a bit of its tail. And then we passed it on to a professional preparator, and he extracted it using mechanical and acid techniques. But if we hadn't x-rayed it, the, the, the alternative would be to split it through the middle and look for the black line in the middle of the, which can be a wee bit destructive. So if you, you've got the luxury of being able to do that, um, it's it's a good it's a good alternative. Right. And where's that specimen come from, um, Bob? If it's you're prepared it's to Tilly share. Hunland, Tilly Hornland Quarry. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's in a nodule, which is unusual for Tilly. Mm -hmm. But well, it's not unusual, but it's not common. Mm -hmm. uh, for our viewers, do you want to um, give us a, de a description? So a nodule is that effectively just a rock to layman people? <laughs> A nodule is a... Because I'm thinking I'm flint nodule, I know what a flint nodule is, ah, and I'm not ah, sure, you know, I, I, it's mm -hmm. obviously there's different terminology in, you know, well, in flint different subjects. So. Flint yeah. nodules are similar because they can have a, a coral or some or, or a mm -hmm. sponge spiracle or, or a, at, at their core. What a nodule is, is, is something... The fossil record is famously described as a race between preservation and decomposition, in that the rate of preservation has got to exceed the rate of decomposition, mm -hmm. so that something exists at the end. And, and nodules are a good example where, for example, a fish dies, falls to the bottom to the lake floor, and these are always in, nodules are always formed in still water, not never rushing water. Falls to the bottom of the lake floor, starts to decompose, but it's also been buried rapidly by silt and other um, components coming in from the, the, the rivers that they're inputting to the lake. It, it can also be, be accumulated around, if around this time, plants had just started to colonize the land and they were around the edges of lakes and rivers. And plants produce um, carbon dioxide, which eventually, and, and calcium, um, carbonate. So eventually, these this kind of chemical um, reaction that, that fall that, that causes makes the the near lakes um, environment rich in calcium carbonate, um, and evaporation makes it even richer because we're in shallow water. So you have a high concentrate of carbonate in the area. Bone is, the bone mineral is calcium phosphate largely, so 
what happens is that a chemical reaction starts to occur with between the carbonate, the phosphate, and the other organic components, which cause the fish to become a nucleus to this soft mass of chemicals that are now forming around it. And by compaction, the soft mass becomes harder and by further chemical reaction. So a nodule is basically a blob of calcium carbonate, hopefully with a fossil inside. Mm -hmm. OK. Sometimes they have no fossil inside, and that's when the decomposition rate exceeded the preservation rate. Okay. So the nodules started to deform, but the fish continued to decompose and eventually disappeared altogether. And all you have is the nodule with nothing inside. And that seems that seems the best way to explain why we most nodules are barren. They don't have anything in them at all. OK, yeah, no, I, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very lucky to find a, a fossil fish inside a nodule. Mm -hmm. um, with the exception of leathern bar, which is quite prolific, but most sites where you find nodules, less than 5% have a fish inside. So, Bob, if you've got 700 specimens, how many nodules have you collected or split <laughs> over the years, do you think? I think I've probably split about 10,000 nodules over the years. Wow. <laughs> and that's, viewers, is why I'm not a paleontologist. I don't have the patience. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's a good day when you come home with a good fossil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it definitely sounds like it's worth a wait, though, yeah. Um, you are also a reviewer of the Scottish Journal of Geology, which is produced by the Ge Geological Societies of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Yeah. So how do you feel Scottish geology is developing? Uh, presumably it's better than it was in the 19th century. I think Scottish geology um, is on a resurgence just now, and it's largely due to a team. Um, Scottish paleontology, I should say, is on a, in a resurgence. Um, it's largely due to the team that, that I work in. And I have to say, I'm not the lead author. Mm -hmm. I've always been second, third, or last author. Um, well, that's not strictly true neither. I've been lead author twice <laughs> in, in, in 30 years. Um, and I'm lead author on the current paper on Levin Bar that I'm, I'm, I'm preparing. But the other 17 or so papers, I've always been a, a secondary author. <laughs> We always uh, end our first part of the in conversation with the same way. How do you ken Elgin Museum? Could, could you repeat the question? <laughs> How do you know Elgin Museum? Oh, right. OK. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I put on ahead. my broad accent for that point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how do you ken Elgin Museum? How do you ken Elgin Museum? <laughs> <laughs> um, it stems back to the late 80s. Um, when I started to get interested in taking kid on kids on picnics, I decided I had to go to, to various museums to, to find out what I was actually looking for. So there's a site called Town at Burn near Fockerbers, which Elgin Museum has got a good collection from. So I wanted to understand what that material looked like. And I heard that Elgin Museum had a collection. So I went there and I've been going back ever since. Um, it, the, the collection is quite spectacular. There's a, there's a fish in one of the display cabinets that I'm not convinced is how it's identified, because it's a bit big for that species, but that's maybe for someone else another day. Um, but yeah, it's, it really is, to me, probably best regional museum in Scotland for, from a standpoint of paleontology and, and everything else that's in there. But my, my, my interest in paleontology, um, it's, it's old school, the way specimens are um, displayed, but old school in a geology and paleontology collection to me is the, is the way to go. Not this interactive stuff with TV screens and push buttons and all this kind of thing. That's, that's for tourist traps like the um, Natural History Museum and the Geology Museum in London, but for a serious understanding of local paleontology, Elgin Museum encompasses the area. 
Uh, you've been a member of the Friends of Hugh Miller, which some of our viewer viewers may know of as an organisation, for about 15 years, and you're currently the chairman of the group. But how did you first get involved with the Friends of Group? It's actually just eight years. Um, okay. <laughs> I've been chairman for eight years, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, how I got involved? Um, <clears throat> once again, that was around about the time that I was doing my research into Scottish sites. I'd gone to research Cromarty and was really um, surprised to find there was a, a museum to Hugh Miller in Cromarty, which I didn't know about before, but this is all 30 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so, but there was no friends um, existing at the time, but I did meet Martin Gostwick and Frieda Gostwick, who were the, um, Frieda was the curator of the museum at the time until she became ill, and then Martin became the curator after that. So I met Frida before Martin, and they were very helpful to me, and they, I've been donating specimens to the museum over the years as well. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it was nothing more than that, just curiosity of what, what, what's at Cromarty and finding the museum. And as soon as I found, as soon as I found the museum and met Martin and Frieda, I was driving back, and I thought, I know there is a bookshop in Inverness, an antiquarian bookshop. So I went in there and I found my first copy of the old red sandstone, which is Hugh Miller's um, benchmark popular science book on on the <clears throat> on the subject, which was a st stream coincidence. Since then, I've I've actually got a first edition, um, which I treasure. Um, and when, I, I, and when Nigel um, died, he gave me a presentation copy just a week before he died um, as as ex chairman to the new chairman. So I've got I've got at least three copies of the old red sandstone there. Right. And what does the group do? Are they do they sort of support the museum? Is there events? Is, you know, is it open for other people to join? Do you want to it, tell us a little bit more about the group? The, yeah, the group is. Um, <clears throat> Very active. We've got about 130 members. We support the museum and the birthplace cottage. There are two buildings um, side by side in Cromarty. Um, we recently, not recently, in the recent past, we had a very generous donation from a Hugh Miller descendant family. Very generous donation which allowed us to fund the salaries of museum staff and keep it open um, for a set period um, every year. So the, the friends are different from other friends groups in that we are financially supporting the museum and the museum is going to be refurbished over the next couple of years and we're funding that. So it's a, it's a much more involved friends group than you normally get. Um, um, I don't think the museum would be open if it wasn't for the Friends because there's not a lot of footfall in Cromarty, so there's not a lot of money being taken at the door. Yeah. Right, and so the museum, is it open uh, seasonally, not all year round? It's open all year round. Okay. From, if I'm correct, but not all day. I think it's okay. open at noon every day. Okay. But it's well worth a visit. Mm -hmm. I'll put some links to that as well in the, yeah. um, in the video text, yeah. Yeah. Many people, once they, once they learn about Hugh Miller, become very interested and in, it becomes a kind of lifelong interest. We, on, on our committee, we've got, what have we got now? We've got a poet, a retired banker. We've got two direct descendants of Hugh Miller, two ladies, um, and myself. And... Yes, I mentioned the poet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> some people from industry as well. So we're a diverse group. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm going to be tendering my resignation at this year's AGM um, simply because I think it needs to become a younger organisation. I'm, I'm 70 next year. Would you believe it? <laughs> and I really want to loosen up my time to do more research. Um, over the years, 
the job of chairman at Friends has become more and more involved. And um, I want to have a couple of days off every week, so um, I'll, I'll remain on the committee, but I think it's time for young blood within the organisation because the organisation will change because the National Trust will change going forward. And that's that's who we that's who we support. So. The eight years as chairman, so I'm, I'm, I'm not at all disappointed that I've chosen that that route. Um, I just think there are younger people of, uh, in the organisation who could do, who could take the organisation in, in a different direction than that, than that old guard. And it does seem to be that's a sort of common um, problems, not quite the right word, but common situation maybe across the museums and heritage sector, um, it's especially in the northeast of of um, the challenge of of trying to bring a, a younger um, a younger group of people through to mm -hmm. you know, share the interest and continue the the work that's gone before. So I think it's a good thing, um, but um, and I've made that decision. But the other, the other stuff we get involved with, and we, we've had several conferences over the years. Mm -hmm. We had one about four years ago, five years ago, yeah. which attracted speakers from the very echelons of paleontology. I mean, John Long came from Australia, wow. self-funded to do it. Um, a lady called Elsa Pancaroli, who writes for The Guardian. Um, She's also yeah. a friend of the museum, yeah, of Elgin yeah. Museum, yeah. She, she gave a wonderful talk. Um, I, and yes, Ralph O'Connor from the University of Aberdeen. Um, I just couldn't believe that we were able to put together such a star studded cast of, of speakers. I even managed to speak myself. <laughs> um, you've touched on some of the excavations that you've carried out um, throughout your career, um, at various sites across Scotland and uh, overseas as well. Uh, locally, um, we know that you've um, worked at Tynet Burn. What was it like there? That was probably that was probably the most ambitious project we ever worked on. Um, <laughs> the Tynet Burn exposure is all backfilled because it was actually ex excavated in 1990 by a, a man called Stan Wood. But he produced a, a record of the the dig that was a bit below par. Um, it was more of a popular science kind of um, record rather than a, a truly accurate record. Um, when Nigel and I and Alton, of course, too, when, when we when we excavate and record rock sequences, we, we, we record to less than centimeter um, level. Um, Stan Wood was recording to the odd foot here and there. Um, and I'm not disparaging Stan, it's just that it wasn't his um, it wasn't his speciality to, to be a, a stratigrapher or a sedimentologist. He was he was obliged to and record the site because he was doing it for commercial purchase purposes. Um, so we decided to do it. And uh, we actually opened up a section that was 30 feet high um, to the extent we got to hire ladders to do the measurements. Um, <laughs> I've, got, I've got photographs of this. I, I've, I've, I've got a problem with heights. <laughs> but I had to have a picture of me up a ladder on the face of Dinah Burn fish bed. So I gritted myself and told Nigel to take a picture very quickly because I was coming down again as soon as I could. <laughs> so I've got, I treasure that photograph um, and <clears throat> up a 30 foot ladder, apparently recording the section at time it burned, but just willing myself to hang on and <laughs> get, get back down safely. So yeah, we did a lot of work there with the University of Aberdeen team. Um, and we gained a lot of information that hadn't been gained before the paper that we produced. I'm probably that's one of my proudest um, um, achievements, I think. I was a co-author on the paper, although all I did was proofread it. Nigel, Nigel wrote the whole thing. But then I did do um, the fish log um, on site. So I did, I did some proper site work and proper academic work, but Nigel did, Nigel did the writing and I got half, half the 
um, praise. So that's how it works in in academia. You know, sometimes you do all the work and get hardly any hardly any praise, and sometimes you do half of it and get most of it. You know. <laughs> and what were you finding at the Tyne at Burn site? For those who are not aware of it, it's 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 a nodule locality, and what we were able to record, which, which Stan wasn't able to record, is that it actually represents a nearshore environment which had at least five um, river transgressions. So you can see in the rocks by, by looking at the by looking at the grain size in, in the rocks and the, the environment that the nodules were formed in, that a river overtook the site at least five times and then receded and we were back to fairly deep lake conditions, which hadn't been recorded before. Um, we also found hard evidence of soft part preservation in some of the fish. We found um, internal organs preserved in fish called acanthodians, which are which are now known to be the early uh, ancestors of sharks. So that's a very exciting um, um, work that I'm also working on just now. That we, we're actually finding early sharks at Tyne at Burn. And is that quite unusual to find the um, the soft tissue preservation, or is that? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's extremely unusual. Um, it's soft parts brought first. So in the decomposition process, all of the organs disappear very quickly, and you're left just the hard parts, bones and scales. And that's what most fossils are: bones or scales, or bones and scales. But every now and again, there can be very special conditions that occur that allow the soft parts themselves or traces of the soft parts to be preserved. And in, in the case of Town at Burn, there were actually two spin-off papers to the Town at Burn um, study. One was the soft parts paper, which I, Nigel allowed me to be first author on, since simply because I noticed them first. I thought, what's that? There's, we've got five specimens here and they've all got the same red marks inside them in the, exactly the same place. And and I just said, it's internal organs. So we wrote the paper um, and I was allowed to lead that. Actually, I did all of the research work anyway. I toured all the Scottish museums, counting how many there were in museum and collections and stuff like that. But soft parts only get preserved through very, very specific organic chemistry conditions or in our, in our case, they were actually preserved by Bacteria. Okay. Um, bacteria, which it was, it was this was controversial at the time. So I remember one medical doctor tells bacteria are not responsible for preservation; they're responsible for decay. So no, no, no. There were good bacteria and bad bacteria. <laughs> and these, these basically munched on the soft parts, the 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 the, the heart, the kidney, the the liver because they're rich in haemoglobin, blood. And they deposited iron oxide, which they'd metabolized through consuming the iron in the, he in, in the heme molecule. So they just simply replaced the, the organ with a residue of iron oxide. And this was actually quite new at the time, and it was also Nigel did another paper with uh, Andrew Knoll, who's a um, bacteria specialist in at Harvard University, and they 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 came up with a really um, compelling case for this is this is how these organs are preserved. So there are actually three papers came out of Tyne and Burns. So it sounds like Tyne and Burns quite an important site, um, not just well, locally but um, nationally even. Yeah, nodule preservation can produce absolutely exquisite um, fossils. Not always, but every nodule has a, has a potential to do that because simply because it locks in um, conditions which then slow right down as the nodule is being formed. So if you're thinking about a fish that dies and falls onto a surface of mud and then starts to get covered up, that's going to be a slower preservation um, process. Um, 
because there's not so many controls as within the nodule kin environment to ex to exclude other agents of uh, like scavengers or agents of decay and trap the environment that's causing the preservation. So the, the, the bacteria were, were trapped within the nodule as it was forming and so allowed the process to, to, to happen. But it doesn't happen every time. And um, what sort of period are we talking about the from the, the remains at Tynet Burn? They're 380 million years old. Okay. Um, and that changes every year, as Alison knows. People adjust these times and, and they go further and further back. In 20 years, they'll be 400 million years old. <laughs> I'm sure it won't, Bob. I'm sure it won't. <laughs> uh, another Murray site, um, Scott Craig, you've been involved there as well, our yeah. home of our um, very own early Titchprod Elgin Erpeton. Yeah. So how did your involvement with that site come about? Just being in the Murray area, I thought, well, I'm going I'm to go and see what Scott Craig is all about. And the information that was available at the time seemed to point towards an exposure that isn't often visited. It's in the back garden of one of the houses, um, over the bridge and down a bit. But we went down into the burn and found that the exposure in the burn is still there. Um, it still yields fossils. They're extremely difficult to collect because they're like paste until they dry out. Um, but then there's a, there, there's a, there's a, there's a good story there too. Murray Council, there used to be an old culvert, which was an old, old style culvert, which is like two concrete drain pipes under the under a bridge. And they kept blocking up with you know, debris and causing flooding. So Murray Council decided that they were going to put in a, a modern precast concrete culvert. But that meant excavating the entire bridge out and into the fossil bearing strata and replacing the bridge. So Scottish National Heritage asked me, since I was local-ish, if I, if I could monitor the building works and see if anything turned up that we haven't seen before. And I said, yeah, OK, I'll do, I'll, I'll do that. Um, just let me know when it's happening. And the oil industry is it's a cruel mistress, really. Every now and again, with, with very little warning, you, you're resting. And so I was. I was in a period of rest when the phone rang and it was Scottish Natural Heritage and said they started the work. And I said I thought I was going to get two, three weeks notice. They said no, they started. So that same day I drove up there. The bridge was completely gone. Alison's got the photographs of this. The bridge is, was completely gone and the entire formation that had never been seen before or not for a long time was exposed. And they're proposing to put in these 10 foot long culvert sections under the bridge. And they're going to put five in. Now, and that would have covered up the exposure again. And I said to the, I said to the clerk of works, can we talk about this? Because that exposure is very useful for, for the future. And you don't need five of these sections in there because you only need to cover what's under the bridge. You don't need to go way upstream. So he phoned his boss. And he said, how many do you want? And I said, well, just put three in. So they put three in and that's then we just landscaped the, the, the formation. So it's there to be excavated um, by by students in the future. And more tetrapod bones are hopefully going to be found. Mm. But if, 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 we, if I hadn't intervened that day, that would have been lost to science. Okay. Um You've already said we've got you've got over 700 uh, fossil fish specimens that you've collected over the years. Uh, do you have other specimens as well? Um, how many specimens do you think you've got? And is there a, a favourite species that you're always happy to find? Oh, that's a that's a difficult one. I do have two specimens of a species that's new to science. Um, and I do have a specimen of a tiny fish of which only one other specimen exists. 
Um, it doesn't look very impressive. Oh, fish a note. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, yeah. OK. It's a, it's a fish called Cephalaspis spinifer. And it, the, the, the only other specimen is so precious that one half of it is in the Natural History Museum and one is in the National Museum of Scotland. Wow. And this one here is new to science. Right, is that a, another armoured fish I'm looking yeah. at? Yeah, it's, you can see these, these spines mm -hmm. and the head and two eyes in the middle. Uh, can you lift that up a bit, a little bit more? Thanks, Bob. Right. right. So that's new to yeah, that's new to science, and the other one, spinifer, is a unique specimen. So my, my family and I are trying to decide what to do with all of this because it's got to go somewhere. I could, if I wanted to, describe the new species, um, write it up in a paper, but I really wouldn't take that on because there are, used to be 171 species of this type of fish and they've got it down to 120 and I think they've got to get it down to less than 30 before you can make sense of the whole thing so adding another species at this point doesn't really make a lot of sense. Oh my goodness that's a huge amount of work then somewhere Bob. Yeah and some people are working on it um, but not in my lifetime I'd, I'd rather leave it to someone else to help sort out the big picture later rather than try and muddy the waters further. Excuse that pun too. <laughs> <laughs> Who said paleontologists didn't have a sense of humour? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've touched on um, nodules a little bit earlier to try and sort of explain it to people like me. Um, and, you know, you, you've said how they're formed and, uh, you know, cracking them open to, to find something and the chances of finding something being quite slim but which how do you decide which ones do merit further investigation? Well paleontology is not like archaeology um, in that we're very destructive um, and <laughs> sounds you, like it. <laughs> you, you can't find a fossil that it's smashing a rock uh, yeah whereas if you find an artifact it goes straight into your tissue paper lined box and is is is, is held like treasure. Um, so the way you find specimens is just to split rocks, and if you find nodules. But the best way to find specimens is there, there are two techniques. A nodule is a round thing, or a okay. or an elliptical thing, and a, fo a fossil would occur on a on a plane within it. So the first technique is to smack it around the edge with a hammer. And if the fossil is presenting a plane of least resistance, it'll split and show you the fossil immediately. But if that doesn't happen, then what you have to do is crack it in half. Okay. And then you can see the line in the middle of the nodule. It's destructive, but I can guarantee that every, every fossil that you see in a museum collection is a jigsaw puzzle that's been glued back together. Because the only way to expose them is to break them up. People do things like retouching them after they've done it because they miss, lose a chip or something like that. They'll fill it in with um, some kind of filler and, and then paint it with some acrylic paint. But and that and that can be done very professionally and and, and it doesn't it doesn't detract from the, the the value of the material, the, the scientific value of the material, and and it actually adds to the financial value of the material because people think they're seeing a, a, a pristine fossil and they're not. But yeah, the, the only way is destructive techniques. Uh, your friend and colleague, the late Professor Nigel Turin, who we've mentioned uh, a few times here, he had a genus of fossil fish, Trewinia magnifica, named after him. Yeah. What would you like your testament to be? Would you like something to be named after you? Would you like something, you know, is it more about seeing the work continued? Well, I'm lucky enough to have a fossil named after me. Okay. It's an Acanthodian fish called Phallodentus davidsoni, which was described two years ago, just before lockdown. Um, so I was very proud of that. And it's based on two unique specimens from 
it's called the May Beds, which is near the Castle of May in, in Caithness. Um, and it's work done by the rest of the group that I work in, but I didn't participate in this, who are re-evaluating Scottish fossil acanthodian fish, these little spiny sharks, um, and they're finding that all is not as it seems, that there are different species there, and these are based on definite an anatomical features. So phallodentis is a kind of Greco-Latinism for false teeth, and this this particular genus of fish don't have teeth, but this particular species, because of its gill structure, looks like it's got molar teeth in the back of its jaw, but they're part they're just part of the gill architecture. So it's called it's called Phallodentis davidsoni. You don't get to choose uh, the characteristics of the fossil. Are they suggesting <laughs> for the false teeth? It's, it's yeah. yeah. False teeth, David Sue and I. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a nice talking point too, though. I mean, it's yeah, definitely. But it's, it's an yeah. honour. Presumably, you would like to see sort of you know works that you've started continuing, and and you know the groups that you've been involved with to sort of continue. Um, not yeah. that we're suggesting you're going anywhere anytime soon, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean. As I said before, I, I see my role as a popularizer of geology. Everyone says everyone's got a, people say everyone's got a book in them. I probably do, but I don't have time to write it. So um, I've sort of restarted my field excursion program. I'm taking Edinburgh Geological Society to the Midland Valley um, late next month. And that's, that, that's why, that's how I see myself going forward, writing these residual papers that um, Nigel and I started all those years ago and carrying on with my field excursion work. OK. So we always end with seven quick questions. These are our quick fire questions, um, which are not designed to trap you in any way, but uh, we're just looking for some uh, quick answers and, and hopefully kind of makes everybody think a little bit themselves. So question one. What's the one thing that you wish you'd known when you began your work with geology paleontology? Oh. I really can't think of anything. Um. Is it surprise? Does it surprise you that you're still doing this work? That you're, you know, how much of your time is now dedicated to it versus your oh, sort of normal okay. working life? Put that way, I never thought it would, it would lead to this. Um, I didn't think I'd become an author. I wanted to. I didn't want. I didn't realise that people would want to give me awards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, if I'd known that at the outset, I might have become complacent. So I'm glad I didn't. Okay, that's great. Um, do you have a favourite film or book about or featuring geology or paleontology? Jurassic Park. Okay. <laughs> um, what site or find from anywhere in the world do you, you wish you'd had a chance to work on? Is there any um, important site in the field? I've always wanted to go to Montana and one of those holidays where you dig up a dinosaur as part of a, te a team that's there. Um, I doubt if I'm going to achieve that now. Um, but then again, my interest in dinosaurs has waned over the years as well. <laughs> because dinosaur information is everywhere. Um, it's extremely well funded in, in America, especially. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I found Leatham Bar. Mm -hmm. I think that's 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 one of my big career achievements and something I never even thought I'd find. I stumbled on it by by just going there and, and finding it. OK, um, question four. What profession other than your own would you like, have liked to have attempted? Is there anything you would want to have done different career wise? <laughs> I, I always wanted to be a scientist. Um, and I saw myself as a chemist or something like that. And then I did O-level chemistry and thought, 
this is boring as hell. Really. <laughs> so I then wanted to become a geologist. Um, and I have to say, reflecting on what's the best way to put this in the in the sixties, the the possibility to go to university to study geology was much more restricted than it is now. Um, out of thirty two kids in my class, only one went to university, and he was the son of a school teacher. And I think that kind of epitomizes the, the situation in, in the 60s where there was a bit of social selection going on um, mm -hmm. through 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 um, academia. Um, and it just it, it was never going to be for me. But then what's happened since then has proven all that wrong. I've, ach I've achieved more than many academics do, and I'm, I'm, I'm not bo I'm not boasting. I'm, 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 I've been told that and uh, I remember a lady from the Open University said to me, you should do a, a science course. And Nadja was sitting there and he said, no, you, ha no, you won't. You've done it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. What's the strangest scenario or location where you've carried out field work or the most dangerous? The most dangerous has to be Libya. Because wandering out into the Sahara Desert in the 70s and 80s was fraught with danger. Um, there were bandits going around. There were military police who were totally unregulated. Um, and you could be arrested at the drop of a hat just for being in a certain place or not having the right documents on you, which we never had at that time because the service company I worked for weren't weren't so scrupulous about um, making sure you had all the right paperwork. So I, I, I would say, yeah. And the other, other, another place used to be Town at Burn, where the farmer used to put a big white bull in the field where the, where the fish bed is. And he said, I'll never put a dangerous beast in the field where, you, where I know you'll be working, so don't worry about it. And I, I can count maybe five, six times for us find myself sitting up on the top of a cliff, staring down at the bull who's staring up at me. And say, <laughs> I just didn't believe the farmer. <laughs> the bull was far more convincing than the farmer. <laughs> um, question six, what's the one common myth about um, geology, paleontology that you'd like to debunk? Well, yeah, that's a good one. And it's, it, 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 it refers to your field of of of, of the work. Every time you mention to a new farmer or landowner or something like that, you're looking for fossils on the field. You say, "Ah, oh, we've got a ring cairn at the top of the hill there." And I say, "Paleontology, it's not archaeology." <laughs> That's really interesting to know because all archaeologists get are, oh, if you dug up any dinosaurs. So it's good to know it works both ways. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we just need to lean into it and just go, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop trying to explain now. Yeah. Uh, the last question What's your must visit what geological must site or museum or a favourite? site or museum somewhere that aside from Elgin Museum which obviously everybody should come to of course in our open season yeah is there anywhere else that you really enjoyed um visiting yes um about eight years ago I attended a conference in Canada on the Burgess Shale which is um relates to the Cambrian explosion of all animal forms that we know nowadays so vertebrates, crustaceans, worms, all seem to appear about 520 million years ago. And the, the classic site for that is the Burgess Shale in Canada on Mount Field. And part of the conference, which was very well attended, I took my wife with me um, and she was scared by a, a moose um, on the main street of, of, of Banff. Um, well, well, I was at the conference, but uh, 
at the end of the conference, there was a, a excursion to the Burgess Shale exposure on the top of Mount Field, led by the World Authority on the site, Derek Briggs. And it was the first time in a long time that I'd climbed any kind of hill. So it took us five hours to hike up on a switchback trail. We got to the top. We sat in the in the quarry and Derek Briggs entertained us and told us all about it. And they have a safe up there that they keep specimens in. So you get to see all the specimens. You're not allowed to take anything. I asked, I asked if I could take a hand sample or just the, the, the lithology and I was told no. That's how paranoid they are. Then on the way back down, I got separated from the main group and we took a different route down. So what they said was, if anyone gets separated, we'll, we'll build cairns um, for you to navigate by. So, so you just look for one cairn and then look for another one about 100 yards on and just follow the cairns. And I got to the bottom, really having had a great day, lost my water bottle, completely dehydrated. And there's a note pinned to a tree saying, bear on the right. And it was a black bear. <laughs> And it was right. It was right next to the road, because that's where black bears feed. The, the, all the berry bushes are ne next to the road, just just at the edge of the trees, and that's where people see the black bears, because that's where that's where they feed on the berries. But they also eat people, yeah. and they, it said, bear on the right. And we were told that if you encounter a bear, make as much noise as you can, whack your walking sticks off the ground, whistle, shout, sing, everything, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> a bear will run away rather than charge. And I started doing that and then two wardens came up and they, they just led me down to the roadside. I never actually saw the bear, but he was there. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> yeah, le Leth and Bar's looking quite tame after that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, Definitely. at least the, the bull's not going to eat you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, thank you very much for your time today, Bob. It's been really fascinating talking with Absolutely. you. Um, I'm sure our audience are going to really enjoy watching this one back. Um, and we'll just say to people, you know, remember to go up to Cromarty as well, Selga Museum, and have yep. a look at the Hugh Miller Museum up there. Um, we'll get some links in the text under the video um, so that people can find out a bit more about Scottish Fossil Code, about local geology societies as well. Yeah. So thank you very much, Bob. Thank you.